Yes, here we are on Monday, April 4th, 2022. It's a, a session of the Storytelling by and for Adult series. And our first storyteller is Mr. Eswaran in Bangalore. Uh, please tell us a little bit about your involvement with storytelling and, um, and, and then please tell us a story. Sure. Uh, my, uh, my claim to fame is that my wife used to tell stories and uh, I thought I would also have a try at it. So I have had a few experiences of storytelling, but I would I rather uh, create stories and I write and I blog. So mm. uh, I don't uh, actually take stories. So whenever it strikes me, I write a blog and then this is one of the stories which has come out of my personal experience. And that's how I am into storytelling per se. So uh, uh, that is my brief introduction. Uh, otherwise, I'm in Bangalore for last uh, 12, 13 years. And uh, earlier to that, I was in Chennai for a long time. So that is my uh, where I come from. So uh, uh, oh, this the story which I would like to uh, talk about today is a personal story. And I would like to uh, share that with you. Uh, can I begin? Yes. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> the title of the story is, uh, uh, I have named it, uh, any which way you look at it, it, it is unfair. That is the title of the story. Uh, uh, let me, uh, and, uh, at the end of the story, I will share the genesis of my personal experience, but now over to the story. When I tell you Arizona, what comes to your mind? a vast expanse of desert, red and orange colored uh, horizons, a very, very dry place, hot place. And uh, you don't see much of sand, but mostly rocks. And uh, that's the sort of image which comes to your mind. And this story is set in uh, Arizona desert. Nearly 300,000 settlement of Navajo tribesmen were there. and uh, all were staying in their little uh, abodes called Hugan. And in Hugan, they were there. It is an octag uh, octagonal uh, hut, uh, very easily built within a day and used using the local resources as mud and uh, uh, wood. They used to create it. And this is littered all over the place. And uh, Navajo uh, tribesmen are settled in the, in the recent times in a place where the government has allocated a huge land of them. But uh, they are essentially a, a bit of farming, bit of animal, and so on and so forth. Now, among these 300,000 people, there was one very young uh, Navajo uh, leader uh, called uh, uh, Bidzil. Uh, Bidzil meant in, in, in their Diné language, it means a strong man. And he was a very strong, handsome man. and. He fell in love with a lady called Ajay, which means in Diné language, literally it means my heart. And really they were made to each for each other couple and they got married and they had the blessings of all the elders in the tribe and they soon had a child and uh, Bidzil was so happy. He was literally jumping over the people and inviting them and giving a big party to each one of them because he had a son. And uh, as tradition would, he said he will become a big man. He'll become perhaps the chief of the tribe. And this is what he hoped for. And he called himself, uh, called him Hahiga. Hahiga in Diné language meant a strong man. And this is what, and he was a young, sprightly young boy who when he was born and uh, people were really happy. <coughs> And uh, soon 10 years passed and the boy grew up and being 10 is a very important uh, landmark for the Navajo people. And that's a the time they prepare the uh, child to become a man. And uh, at this time, something happened and he was not feeling well on his 20th, 10th birthday. And the shaman had to be called to uh, say, what is it? is wrong with my boy and the shaman had come in there. Now this was happening there. Now let's turn to another person who was there nearby and that was Nashoi. Nashoi was a nocturnal lizard which used to stay in outside of the Hugan. It used to stay there and watch people go up and down. 
but in the daytime it was very drowsy and it seen being nocturnal it never actually saw people but it just used to laze around there but when the twilight came it was very active why because the insects used to fly upwards because of the setting sun to catch as much heat as possible and when the sun set the insects were coming down they were thoroughly confused and that's a time nasha you had his belly full of insects and uh, being a lizard it used to take all the insects now this today he was there and he noticed for the first time that someone came out of the hogan after the sunset and that someone went and stood in near the fence and looked out at the setting sun and he said this is very surprising i have never seen people come out after sunset here and why is it suddenly i see people who are coming out of sunset and he decided to wait through the night and keep awake over the night so the next day morning he could meet his uh, cousin the daytime gecko called bishoi and bishoi promptly was there at 7 in the morning because he used to start his day by 7 and bishoi said wow what are you doing here i thought by now you will be going back to sleep but nashoi said no i was very surprised to see a, a person come out of the hogan and look at the setting sun is he also like me nocturnal or what is wrong with him then uh, uh, bishoi said because bishoi is a daytime lizard he saw all the thing which happened inside the house and he saw he said something is wrong with that boy ahiga and ahiga uh, the shaman said he felt is very sad that he is something wrong with him i don't know what is wrong with him but they all shook their head <coughs> and this is what has happened so that evening again nashoi waited <coughs> he woke up in the as a day ended he woke up had his fill of uh, insects stuck out his tongue at a moth going nearby and he went there and he waited to see whether the boy is coming out again and then he said the sun just set and someone came out of the hogan they opened the door of the hogan came out and went and stood near the setting sun watching from the rocky fence there so he went there and uh, struck up a conversation with ahiga who was standing there ahiga was absolutely non plus he said wow a talking uh, lizard i never knew what was more surprising for him was the lizard was talking in dine language which is the local language they spoke and he says are you nocturnal like me i also like to come out in the evening i don't come out in the sun i hate it he said yeah my my friends all come out in the sun time but i am not able to come out in the sun something is wrong with me he says what is wrong with you i said i don't know my father uh, bidzel and my wife uh, my mother ajay said that long back something happened and therefore you are not well so this increased the curiosity of nashoy and says tell me tell me what happened what is wrong with you he said about 150 years back some white men took my forefather and all his tribes people for a long walk nearly 300 mile walk lasting 18 days they made them walk for 18 days on 300 miles took them to another place it was so hot i believe all the old men perished all the children had difficulties and their skin burned and after four years they were all made to walk back to the original place again and something happened there i think by which i am not able to come out in the sun by the time nashoi got distracted there was a, 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 a huge insect going nearby he stuck out his tongue grabbed that insect and said oh continue your story so he says i don't know but something happened to my forefathers and other people then by which i am not able to see the sun and be out in the sun he says oh that means you are like me i also hate the sun now that i am here in the night you can talk to me and we can be friends that's what nashoi told ahika ahika was very happy he found all his friends used to play in the daytime and he had no more friends and he used to now come out in the night simply watch the setting sun and 
spent his time. Few days passed and Nashoi met Ahiga again. This time he saw Ahiga had red splotches all over his face. And Ahiga said, Nashoi, I probably will not be there around in, in about five years time, I'll probably be gone. And he said, that is all that to me. Bitzel, his father, on the other hand, was very, very upset. He desperately wanted a son. And here we have Aiga who could not continue his uh, lineage. As per his tribal rules, he could marry Ajay's sister. But unfortunately, Ajay had no more sisters. And the shaman had come and told him that Ajay cannot deliver any more child. If at all she will be able to deliver, it will again have the same problem as Ahiga. They too will suffer from this. So nothing can be done. He was a very distraught man. Slowly he lost all contact and communication with Ahiga. Ahiga felt completely entombed in his own hoga and he could never come out during the day. And as days passed, Ahiga became more lonely and after a few years, he passed away. Now that is the story which I had written. Now this is based on a personal friend of mine in Bombay, where he had suffered from this ailment called XP. In our modern terms, it's called Xeroderma pigmentosum. It, it is very rare and it affects probably one in 100,000 people. But what was recently found was that the Navajo tribes the incidence is as much as 1 in 30,000. And surprisingly, very many people are suffering from that. And one of the theories is that it is because of the long march that the Navajo tribe had to do 150 years back, where they were taken for 300 miles in scorching sun for nearly 18 days. They settled for four years in the other destination, but they were returned back and came back walking again. So this was the story which I had written on this. Uh, I am open to comments and questions. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, did you live in the USA for some time? No, I didn't live, but I was there for a few, uh, maybe four or five weeks, but I was mostly in the New York and Miami area. I could not visit. Uh, the, this place in my question, the Navajo place, I could not. But it, so it's interesting that you you placed the story in um, in Arizona with the with these Native American people who yes. you know it, you didn't meet, but somehow you decided to place it in that location. Yeah. So I was doing research on uh, XP, the the Zeroderma pigmentosum, and I uh, came across this article how the incidence is low worldwide, but in Navajo tribes it is higher. And then I went back to the history and saw what could be the possible reasons. And many people believe this is probably a genetic disorder created out of the long march which they had. Mm -hmm. That was when the the white people were forcing the Native American people to to leave their land. Yeah, and they they moved them to Mexico side. Yeah, and then after some time, uh, after four years, whatever be the reason, they were taken back and settled back in where they came from. Mm -hmm. But this uh, uh, walking up and down had created the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1988, which is what, um, 30, 34 years ago, uh, I, I walked across the countryside here in Tamil Nadu. Okay. Uh, I was young. I was a young uh, person, and um, I was studying um, Sila Parigaram, the the epic of the ankle yes. bracelet. And so I thought it would be a good idea to walk the path that the uh, the heroine of the of the story walked, and you know talk to people along the way. So uh, you know the story begins on the east coast in Pumpuhar, and then she went to Madurai, and then the um, and then the western mountains. So uh, when, when I was in, in Madurai and then leaving Madurai to walk to the mountains, 
on that day, it was very hot. And I was walking and I did not have a hat. And that night, I saw that I had a, I was bleeding on the side of my uh, uh, head here. The sun in South India here, it can be so hot, it can, it can cause a, um, uh, a laceration, not just, you know, not just getting red, but it can cause a, a, a cut in the skin yes. from that heat. After that, I, 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 I used an umbrella. The people <laughs> laughed fact, at me. They laughed at me. It reminded me of the. Uh, they reminded me of the America's song, which says, uh, "Horse with no name" is a popular song of America's, and it says, "The heat was hot." Yes. It's a very interesting usage. The heat was yes. hot. And in the desert, you can't remember your name. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely right. Hmm. Anyone else? So this it, research was just you. You had the interest in this skin condition. Or you you knew something. Yeah. So my friend actually, I has I, I he was my friend in Bombay, and uh, subsequently I lost touch with him because we could not meet in a very common time at all. But he used to be fully clothed when he comes out in the night. The the van used to go right up to his house so that he can get into the van, not get exposed to the elements. And uh, subsequently, after a few years, I had gone to Bangalore and called him up and I was told by his family that he is no more. Hmm. So Sorry. that was the uh, uh, memory of mine, which I said, okay, let me write a story about that. Mm -hmm. So I did some research on the skin condition and then the, the story came up and then that's how I formulated the story. Mm -hmm. All right, so anybody, any... Uh... Questions, comments, resonations? Excuse me just one second. I've got, I, go ahead, Gustavo. I I guess I, I was very interested in your story, but uh, I had a little problem with the names, all the names and all the names that I didn't know. But I just imagined that this moving of all those people, I think the Cherokees had also moving, they, they had the problem of moving. Right? But, but, and, and a disease and a long time ago it's interesting to think the fact that making things think that the pandemias or, or that kind of well, pandemias or sickness can be um, linked metaphorically or in stories too long ago i think that's interesting yeah in fact the names i have chosen are all uh, uh, navajo names so Biz Dil uh, does mean, uh, you know, the, uh, a very brave man. Uh, Ahiga is a strong man. Uh, mm -hmm. And Ajay is uh, my heart. That uh, translates to my heart. And uh, uh, Nashoi is a lizard in uh, Navajo language, Dine language. Uh, uh, so that's how the names have come out. Oh, okay. Thanks. It's a... Um... Uh, I think in South America, sometimes they, they call this uh, like magical realism. Claro, el de García Márquez. Yeah, the, when, when, the, uh, when the animals yes. can talk. Yes, mm -hmm. si. Si. When García Márquez comes that, from Colombia, comes mm -hmm. that, 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 uh, that term, that, that, that uh, form of, of writing. I mean, we have it in fairy tales. But uh, yes. but I think also it happens in uh, magical realism. Yes. All right. Well, to me, the, the the thing that jumps out at me is the um is the way you you took this um this topic, the skin condition, and you um and you 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 created a story uh, in in America with these Native American people who you never met, you never visited them, but somehow you decided to to uh, to place the story there. Well, you said those people especially have a, it, that, that condition is very common with them. Yeah, it is a, a slight aberration, statistically speaking. Mm. So that is one of the topics being researched these days. Uh -huh. Okay, so maybe that's why you, you place the story there. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, any uh, the final thoughts before we move to the next story? No, I had a, conception 
go ahead. When Mr. Ishwaran was telling that story and how Arika said that he could only come out at night and not during the sundown or face it, mm. for a second, I felt that what happened to his ancestors was when they were taken, I think those white men were, I know this sounds weird, but I thought they were vampires in disguise. And I didn't think it was a disease which was affecting them. I thought it was vampirism which affected them. Like those men which took them, the white men, they must have been vampires in disguise. Like vampires are very well known for disguises, right? And they are generally white pale men with red skin and bronze or brown hair and red eyes. They're mm. known well for that, right? Mm. So I, for a moment, thought that they were going to be vampires. They were vampires when they came back after four years. Mm. And which is why they couldn't face the sun. I didn't know it was a disease which affected them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, I, 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 I phone Iana. Is that, is that your name? I phone Iana? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. No, not. It's, I phone used to be my first name. I changed it to per people. So, um, okay. to Madam Nayana. <laughs> okay, uh, and it's, um, you're you're in a beautiful place there. Uh, what what what? I'm what, in. Uh, the, where are you? This is a river. This is Neshoba River in um, Concord, Massachusetts. Ah, wonderful. And, and I'm in a. Um, there's a beautiful river. I'll come closer so you can see the water. Yes, but then um, I think. Uh, do, Maybe we should turn your camera off for, for a little bit because um, yes. uh, it's a little distracting. Uh, are, are, you yes. heading I had one... um, are you heading someplace yeah, where you I'm... sit down? Yeah, yes, and from now on, I'll be in my house not walking. I just the timing. I, um, I have a quick question. Go ahead. What color, the, the white, was there white skin or white? What was the white color? associated with the disease was there something about the skin that was white or ashy no the 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 uh, the particular condition called zero derma pigmentosum uh, essentially they uh, the skin turns darker because the sun tends to burn it uh -huh. and they can't manage the uh, they can't tolerate the heat of the sun i see okay thank you it was quite a story very Thank good. you. Okay, so Thank you you've, so you've turned off your camera for a while. I think that's good. Yeah. When you get when you get yeah. settled, Thank you. when you get settled, please turn it on again if you can. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Lalitha, are you ready? Yes, Eric. I'm ready. Very good. Okay. So, uh, Lalitha, please uh, introduce yourself and uh, tell us about your work and please tell us a story. Thank you, Eric. Hello all, uh, I'm Lalita. I'm from Chennai, south of India. Uh, I'm into storytelling for the past two years. I have my own program called Speak Through Stories and I conduct storytelling sessions for children on weekends. I thank Eric for giving me this opportunity to narrate a story which I have written and it's called A Bottle of Poison. Here I go. रुक जाना नहीं तू कहीं हार के कांतों पे चल के मिलेंगे साए बाहर के ओराही 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 It was a beautiful, pleasant evening. Yare Lal was enjoying his evening walk, singing his favorite song. He was walking towards the market square of Badalpur town. Now, Pyare Lal lived in the small town of Badalpur. He was a very wise man. And more than anything, he was extremely friendly and lent an ear to one and all, which was why he was the most popular man in the town. Even now, he was going towards the market square so that he could observe all the hustle and bustle meet up with people, inquire after them, and have a good time. As he was walking, he approached a shop and he saw young Raju, who was looking very agitated and he was sweating and he was very, very uh, desperately asking the shopkeeper for something. Pyarila went nearer 
and heard the conversation. Kaka, Kaka, please, please somehow give me a bottle, Kaka. I need it urgently. Raju was pleading to the shopkeeper. Raju, you know, na, I don't sell rat poison anymore. Why are you going on asking? Kaka, please understand. I need the bottle urgently, Kaka. But Raju, there's no demand these days. Kaka, Kaka, why don't you go inside and search in the storeroom? Insisted Raju. Yarilal was intrigued. So he stood on to listen to the conversation. The shopkeeper went inside to the storeroom. Raju was very fidgety, restless. He was sweating. And finally, the shopkeeper emerged out of the storeroom and he said, Raju, it seems to be a lucky day. You know, I found one old bottle in the storeroom. And here, here you go. And before the shopkeeper had finished his conversation, Raju grabbed the bottle, paid in a hurry, and started walking fast. Yarelal was intrigued. He started following Raju. And he stopped him and said, Raju beta, how are you? Long time, no see. Raju turned with a start. Oh, Pyarela ji, namaste, namaste. Uh, Pyarela ji, I'm in a hurry. I need to leave now, Raju said. Are Raju beta, why don't you just wait? All you youngsters, you all seem to be in a hurry, always. Come on, spend some time with this old man, have some tea, Pyarela ji said. Raju, Sir so Raju was again turned back and said, Pyarelalji, please understand. I'm in a hurry now. Please let me go. Namaste, namaste. Pyarelalji stopped Raju and said, Raju, what is it? What is it that I see in your hand? A bottle of rat poison? Why do you need that? Pyarelalji, there's a lot of rat menace in my house. I need the bottle. I have to leave now. But Raju, wait. You know, na, our town Badalpur is completely rat free. In fact, we got an award for it. And we are maintaining the same status. Nobody in this town needs rat poison. Tell me, Raju, why is it that you really need this rat poison? My God, questions after questions after questions. Why do I even have to answer your question? Shouted Raju. I'm not answerable to you, Pyari Lalji. I'm not answerable to anybody. Everybody keeps asking me questions. I'm fed up of this life. I really don't know what to do. I can't live peacefully. And now I can't even die peacefully. Saying so, Raju broke down completely and was hysterical. Pyarelalji got him to the side, made him sit on the bench and said, Raju, calm down. It's okay. Tell me, tell me. I know, Pyarelalji, you're not going to leave me without listening to my sob story. Okay, fine. Here I go. You know, Pyarelalji, I have this family business. It's been coming for generations. It's hand-woven cotton sari business. But suddenly... There seems to be no demand for handwoven cotton saris anymore. My business is facing heavy losses. I am in total debt. Really, it is terrible, Pyarelalji. And one side, this business is so bad. When I come home, oh my God, it's even more depressing. My wife, she always has this morose look or a complaining look. And she just goes on, Pyarelalji. She says, Raju, you've come home so late. Raju, you didn't come for lunch. Raju, you don't talk to me. Now, come on, Pyarelalji. How do you expect me to come home for lunch when I have so many business problems? How does she expect me to talk to her when everything so much is running in my mind? And she goes on and she says, Raju, I've tried a new dish. Why don't you try? As though that is the most important thing when I have so many problems. And then she again goes on, Pyarelalji. She says, Raju, you don't spend time with the children. Raju, you are not at all the same anymore. Questions after questions, an accusation after accusation, she goes on. And if I lose my cool, you understand? No. If somebody goes on accusing you, you lose your cool. She says, Raju, you've become short-tempered. Just yesterday at Pyarelalji, she told me, Raju, you've become a very difficult person to live with. Can you imagine my own wife telling that I've become a very difficult person to live with. What is the purpose of my life? My children, that's another sob story, Pyarelalji. It's as though I don't exist for them at all. Either they are happily playing or they fight like cat and dog. And when they have to chat, of course, they have their mama to go to. You tell me, Pyarelalji, I'm a total failure. My business is a failure. My family life is a failure. I don't seem to be needed for anyone. 
That is why I have completely given up. Pyare Lalji heard all this and he started. Now, Raju, Pyare Lalji, don't start this advice session. I am not in a mood for all this advice and gyan from you. You wanted my story. I've told my story. But Raju, no, Pyare Lalji, my life, my choice. That's all. And when Raju told this, Pyare Lal noticed the bottle in Raju's hand and said, Raju, look at this label. See, see the expiry date of the bottle of poison? What? Pyare Lalji, you want me to see the expiry date on a bottle of poison? Yes, Raju, it is not for another three months. See, see, this expiry date is not for another three months. My God, what does it matter? Asked Raju in a very irritated manner. Paralalji took the bottle and said, See, Raju, this bottle doesn't expire for another three months. Just three months now. So I have an idea. I'll keep this bottle with me for three months. And I promise you, okay, I really promise I'm a man of honor. That just before the expiry date, I'll come and return it to you. But my friend, I'm just asking you to hang on for just another three months. Raju was irritated. He looked at Pyarelalji and said, Pyarelalji, are you joking? You want me to suffer for another three months? Anyway, you tell me already my life is so miserable. Another three months, what magic is going to happen? Are you a magician, Pyarelalji? Come on. Pyarelalji smiled at Raju and said, See, Raju, I'm not a magician. But yes, I can share with you three tips that have helped me in my life. Tip number one. When things don't go according to your plans, you need to alter your plans. Tip number two, when you see goodness, goodness comes to you. And tip number three, communication is the key to any relationship. See, these are the three tips which have helped me, but it's your choice, Raju. I'm not forcing you. It's your life, your choice. If you want, you follow them. I don't understand anything, Pyarilalji, but okay, you're insisting so much. And since I respect you, I agree. It's written in my fate that maybe I have to suffer for another three more months. Saying this, Raju just got up and walked away. Yare Lal also took the bottle of poison and walked away. The next day, Raju was walking in the market square. He saw a huge hoarding, a billboard, and there was a government notice which said, all plastic bags, all carry bags made of any kind of plastic, single-use plastic is going to be banned effectively from the first of the next month, which was just a week away. Now, Raju saw this uh, notice from the government and it, the government said it's going to be punishable if anybody uses all plastic bags after a week. And he saw all these shopkeepers huddled together and talking to each other. He went towards them and the shopkeepers were like, oh my God, what are we going to do? We use plastic bags for everything. Plastic bags can hold weight. And this government is saying, now we have to be environment friendly. And then we have to use, what is all this? Uh, what is all this? Environment friendly, easily disposable bags, biodegradable bags. Where do we get such bags? Raju suddenly remembered Pyarelal's words. What were they? When things don't go according to your plans, you need to change your plans. And a flash of an idea came to Raju. He turned to the shopkeepers and said, Bhaiya, how about cloth bags? Ha, huh, cloth bags, not bad. But where do we get cloth bags in a week's time? Asked the shopkeepers. Now, Raju was in a new energy mode. And he said, Bhaiya, Bhaiya, I can provide your cloth bags for your shops. Really? You know, we need this particular size. We need bags which can hold different weights. You just tell me the specifications. I shall meet all your requirements. But yes, sir, the government has said within a week, we should dispose all the plastic bags and use only all these kind of, you know, uh, biodegradable bags. Yes, bhaiya, don't worry. Within a week, I will give you all your orders. Raju was fully enthusiastic and he walked towards his mill. He called all his workers. He got all the fabrics and the designs which are going to be used for saris. But instead, he told them to design different cloth bags and for different sizes, whichever he had asked those shopkeepers and vendors. And soon everybody got to work. Now, Raju worked day and night to meet all the orders and he supplied it to all the shopkeepers in the marketplace. 
he went about asking different people, the gift shops, the function halls, even door to door, asking for requirements for cloth bags. And in a few days time, business was slowly picking up and Raju was slowly and steadily improving his business in a new manner. Days passed by, Raju seemed less stressed now because his business was taking a new turn. One day, when he was having dinner at home, he ate the sabzi and he said, Radha, the sabzi is so tasty today. Radha was startled. It had been ages since Raju had actually complimented her cooking. She gave a genuine smile and said, Raju, that's so sweet of you. I'll get you some more. She went to the kitchen and got, and Raju was also startled. You see, it had been ages since Radha had given him a genuine smile and actually called him sweet. And then he remembered Yarelal's second word, second tip. When you see goodness, goodness comes to you. That evening, husband and wife had a pleasant dinner. The next morning, Raju saw his wife grinding the idli batter with her hand with a rolling stone. And she said, Radha, what happened to the mixi? Why are you using your hand to grind the batter? She said, Raju, the mixi is repaired and it cannot be repaired anymore. I know you're facing problems in your business. So I didn't want to burden you with the additional expense. Raju slowly started observing his wife. He realized that she did all the household chores without any domestic help. He also realized that her portion of vegetables and fruits were always lesser than what was served to her husband and children. And that's when it hit Raju that the struggles weren't his alone. His wife also had her own share of struggles. That evening, Raju saw his second son struggling with his homework. And Raju was in a good mood. So he went to his son and said, Are Dhru, what happened? Why are you struggling with your homework? The son was also surprised. He had never seen his dad smiling at him for ages. Not, and not only that, coming and helping him for homework. Initially, the son was hesitant, but he opened up to his dad. And the father and son had a nice evening solving homework and chatting. The next morning, when the elder son tried to boss over the younger son and get into the fight, Raju intervened, had a chat with them. And in a flash, he remembered Yarelal's third tip, communication is the key to any relationship. That moment, Raju made a decision that he would definitely spend time with his children and talk to them regularly. Well, days passed by. Raju's business was flourishing. Husband and wife became a pillar of support for each other. The children, they felt very secure and comfortable with their parents. Raju was really happy. One morning, he had a visitor Oh, yes, it was Pyarelalji. Raju saw him. He was so excited. He said, Pyarelalji, welcome, welcome, welcome. Please sit, please sit. You know, Pyarelalji, I was planning to come and visit you, but there's so much of work and there's so many things I have to do. Pyarelal. Wait, Raju, take a breath. I'm here. I'm there to listen to you the entire day. Wait. But Pyarelalji, you need to listen to everything. And Raju poured out everything to Pyarelalji all about his new business ventures, his cloth bag business, his wife, his family, his children. And he said, Pyare Lalji, you know what? I'm so happy now. And you know, Pyare Lalji, the three tips you gave me were actually right and they helped me. And it was true, Pyare Lalji. Thank you so much. Pyare Lalji was so happy to listen to Raju. He said, I'm very happy for you, Raju. But he couldn't resist one thing. He took out the bottle of poison from his pocket and gave it to Raju and said, Raju, my friend, you see, I am a man of honor. Today is the expiry date for this bottle of poison. And it's your life, your choice, Raju. I have to hand over the bottle. So I have come to give you the bottle of poison. Raju was totally startled. But yes, he broke into a laughter and he said, Oh my God, Pyarelalji, only you can come and return this bottle of poison. But anyway... How does the expiry date on this bottle bother me anymore when I have learned to set an expiry date for all my problems? Pyarelalji said, well said, Raju. He got up and he walked away singing, Ruk jana nahi tu kahi haar ke kanto pe chal ke milenge saaye bahar ke Which means, my dear friends, do not stop 
accepting defeat because only when you walk on thorns will you receive the shade of spring. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Eric. So that's the story that you made up. Yes, Eric. Actually, uh, how I've made up the story is uh, my mentor, Mr. Mohan, gave us a question and asked us to write a story around this concept. So he said, what if the expiry date on a bottle of poison is breached? Does it become more poisonous or less poisonous? So he asked the storytellers to just think of a story and write. And the story came up to my mind and I just wrote it. And uh, why I wrote the story was, okay, these days, there are a lot of these things, issues are happening and people may not physically commit suicide, but there's a lot of mental suicide happening. Like we hear cases of uh, mental health issues, depressions, relationship breakdowns. So, if, you know, if you're resilient to change, if you know how to communicate, I think people should know that. And that is why I just got it in my story. That's all. Anybody, any thoughts, comments? That's a very thoughtful story. Um, how it is that some people would find in their lives some person that can um, give those three advices in time? Yes, definitely. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Needy, are you are you ready? Yes. And I know I should introduce you as Pip and Squeak, because <laughs> that is your professional name. No, I, my professional name is still Nidhi Gujral. That's the name of my storytelling initiative. Ah, OK. Yes. Well, uh, uh, please introduce yourself and your initiative. Uh, uh, and, um, and then please tell us a story. Sure. Hello and good evening, everyone. My name is Nidhi Gujral. I'm a storyteller from Kolkata, India. And I run a storytelling initiative called Pip and Squeak that where I tell stories to kids. And I've just ventured into storytelling for adults as well. So I'm just testing the waters there. And today I'm gonna uh, tell you all a folk tale that I heard as a child from my grandmother. And it goes like this. Once the great Shahanshah Akbar, the emperor of India fell extremely ill. And because of his illness, he was unable to sleep till the wee hours of the morning. And because of the lack of sleep, he was always tired and angry and frustrated. And everyone around him was bearing the brunt of it. So they all were looking for a solution for the king's strange problem. All the best physicians and hakims and the saints were summoned from all over the kingdom. They all came down to check on the king. They all uh, prescribed their own treatments. Lots of different roots and shoots and lotions and potions were suggested, but no treatment seemed to be working. And then one day, somebody said that a wise man from China was visiting India, who had the reputation for having the solution to any disease. He had the, the solution to any disease. He could cure anything. As soon as the emperor heard about him, he sent a summon. He was asked to arrive at the kingdom to have a look at the king. And so this wise man arrived. And when he did, everyone looked at him hopefully. He was a tiny little man with a big paunch, which was well covered with the long silken robes that he was wearing. And his long white beard swayed as he waddled into the king's chambers. And as he entered, he bowed before the king and he said, your majesty, I am honored to be in your company and I do hope 
that I can be of service to you. Akbar had heard so much about this wise man that he couldn't wait for him to begin his treatment and suggest a cure. And so he got to work. He checked the king from top to toe very thoroughly. He peered in his eyes and inside his ears and into his mouth and every other place. And then he finally held the king's wrist to check his pulse. He closed his eyes and frowned. And then he shook his head from left to right. And then after a few seconds, he opened his eyes as though he'd had a sudden realization. With that serious expression on his face, the king got very nervous. And he said, well, what do you think? Is there a cure for my situation or no? And that serious expression suddenly turned into a laughter and he said, yes, your majesty, of course. Of course, there's a cure for your situation. And the only cure for your situation is stories. Stories? The king was confused. How do you say? Yes, your majesty, you see, in your situation, you need to rest. And to rest, you need to relax. And what's better than stories to relax you? And so the king was slightly convinced and then he said, but who's gonna tell me so many stories? That is simple, your majesty. You have so many courtiers and ministers. If you appoint them to take turns and tell you a story every evening, you'll, you'll manage. And so the king was finally convinced. He thanked the wise man and immediately after he left, he called all of his courtiers and ministers and he instructed them to take turns to tell him a story every single evening before he retired to bed. So from that evening onwards, everyone was very relieved. Well, telling stories was not that difficult. And so that evening, the first courtier went into the king's chambers to tell him a story. And as he was narrating the stories, the others were all waiting outside the chambers to see what was going to happen and how it was all going to pan out. And as the story was being narrated, the others waited and waited and waited and they waited till they all fell off to sleep. So the second evening, once again, another courtier went in and as the story was being narrated, there were all others waiting outside and they all waited and waited and once again, <sighs> They all went off to sleep. And this started happening every single evening. The courtiers were all frustrated. They were tired and they were complaining that the king just wouldn't sleep. Every time the story ended, he would ask, what next? And so they would have to narrate another story. And when that story ended, they would have to narrate another story because the king would ask, what next? And that way the whole night, the storyteller had to keep telling stories till they were tired, but there was no sign of sleep from the king. So they all got together to look for a solution to this problem. And the only person that they could think of was Birbal. Now Birbal was the wittiest and the cleverest minister in Akbar's court. And so they all went to him with, his, with their problem. Uh, Birbal, Birbal heard them out very patiently. And then he began thinking, hmm, okay. All right, I'll take care of it. Tell your majesty that I will be telling him a story tonight. When Akbar got to know that Birbal would be telling the story tonight, he was looking forward to it. He was very fond of Birbal because of his witty and clever uh, wittiness and, the cle and cleverness. So he started looking forward to the evening. So that evening when Birbal walked into the king's chambers, the king welcomed him with open arms. Come, come Birbal, I've been looking forward to this evening. I know it's going to be wonderful. 
Let me just settle down and then you may begin. So the king settled down on his bed. He relaxed and he instructed Birbal to begin his story. Birbal started narrating. He went on with his first story that went on for a while. And at the end of the story, the king asked, okay, what next? So Birbal started another story and he kept looking at the time. It was getting rather late and he kept looking at the king while telling the story, but there was no sign of sleep. By the time the second story ended, once again, the king asked, what next? So Birbal thought it was time for him to end this. So he said, all right, my Lord, I think I have just the story for you. Let me start the story. Once there was a hunter. The hunter lived in a small little hut in the middle of, the, of a very, very large forest. And because he lived in the forest, there were so many other animals and birds around him. Now the hunter was very well equipped to handle the wild animals. But his problem was the birds. Really? How so? Asked the king. The birds would come into his house every single day and they would pick all the grain and create a royal mess. The hunter had tried to solve this problem many a times. He tried all the tricks in the book, but he just wasn't able to find the solution. He wasn't able to get rid of the birds. So one day he came up with a plan. He thought he would go to the market and buy the biggest cane basket that he can and he would hide all of his grain inside it. And so that's what he did. <clears throat> he went to the market and he bought the biggest cane basket. <coughs> and he hid all of his grain inside it and he left for his hunting. So that day when he left, the birds came in as usual. They looked all around, but they did not find any grain. And then they saw that cane basket and they went straight at it because they knew it had to be there. Really? What happened next? Asked the king. What happened next was they started pecking at the basket and they pecked and they pecked and they pecked. But the more they pecked, the more they injured their beaks. But they weren't able to get any grain out of it. So among those birds, there was a very intelligent and clever sparrow. The sparrow said, this is not going to work out. We need help. And I know just who's going to help us. The sparrow went straight to his friend, the mouse. And he struck a deal with the mouse that if the mouse agrees to help them make a hole in that cane basket, he can take as much grain as he wants. The mouse agreed. He came and he began nibbling at that basket. He nibbled and he nibbled for hours. Really? And then what? Then what? He made a hole in the basket and he took as much grain as he could and he left. And the birds that were there, they were very happy with the grain and they, they started getting all of the grain. And so this news spread in the whole forest. And so all of the other birds of the forest also came and sat outside the house waiting for their turn. You know, your majesty, how many birds there were? How many? Asked Akbar. There were 500 birds. Okay, then what? Then what happened, your majesty? The first bird came in, picked up one grain in the beak and brrr, she flew away. And then second bird came in she picked up one grain in her beak and brrr, she flew away. You know what happened after that, your majesty? What happened? The third bird came in. She picked up a grain in her beak and brrr, she flew away. And then the fourth. But by now, Akbar was so annoyed. He said, people, stop. How many more birds are going to come and take the grain? My lord, I told you, there were 500 birds. And so far only four birds have gone in. So there are 496 birds left. 
and you see the hole was so small, they could only go one at a time. So anyway, where was I? Yes, the fifth bird went in and picked up the grain and she flew away. Now Akbar was completely annoyed. He said, Birbal, I can't take it anymore. When are the birds going to finish picking up all this grain? Birbal looked at Akbar and said, they will stop when you stop saying, what next? So that was my story. Thank you. Beautiful. Very nice. Thank you. So what, what really attracted you to that story? I thought it was a very humorous story. It was a very lighthearted story. And at the same time, it was quite a witty story. So that's what mm -hmm. attracted me to it. And I have been hearing this story for since I was a child. So mm. yeah. Well, it was a way to, um, to deal with a, a very demanding uh, uh, authority figure. Mm -hmm. Anybody, any thoughts? Does it remind you of anything else? Uh, here, uh, you know, a variation to a similar story was, uh, uh, he, the, the, the doctor comes to the king or one of the authority figures and says, you will get cured provided you don't think of the color green. And then he goes away and that person is desperately tries not to think of the color green, but he only thinks of the color green. So that's how it is. So he says, therefore, it won't be cured or something like that. And he leaves him in a confounded situation like that. Okay. Of course, it, it reminded me at first of um, the, the Shahrazad. The, 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 the thousand Arabian nights, nights, yes. Yeah, okay. where a different woman yeah. has to tell a story every night. Yes. Uh, and then some, finally, somebody puts an end to the king's um, uh, demanding, uh, unfair, unfair, unfair demands, exhausting demands. Mm. Go ahead, Vina. Uh, yeah, as Nidhi said, childhood, uh, she has been hearing that since childhood. It brought back memories of uh, us gathering around my grandfather and asking him for stories. Well, my mother used to be in the kitchen. And then every time we used to say, okay, one more. Okay, one more. What next? Mm. What next? So he invented one story, I think so, about a big um, hungry um, Rakshas. Rakshas means like a demon. And then, of course, when mummy was cooking, all the aromas wafting, wafting into the outside room, he used to add that one more element, one more element, till finally, ding, 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 ding. Okay, it's time to eat. Let's go. Hmm. This uh, story I had heard in Hindi. So when in Hindi, what next is pir? You know, you say pir. So, you know, it actually goes together because the, the, uh, the king says pir and Akbar says pur. So, you know, it, it goes together. It's like in tandem, both the things. So it and sounds they, even more humorous when you hear it in Hindi. And they say it's a Marathi folktale. I don't know. I have never heard it as a Marathi folktale. I'm a Maharashtrian, but I okay. have never heard it. Uh, I got to know I've it heard only the from, Hindi version of it. <laughs> I've only uh, heard it from a couple of other uh, storytellers and of course in A.K. Ramanujam's book. Very, very Moira? Moira, go ahead. Yeah, 
And I, I loved your storytelling, also how you use the camera and were really talking to us. So it's, uh, uh, there's one thing which uh, struck me in the end when you say what next and what then and so on, you feel the eagerness uh, of the king. He wants really wants to hear. And before it seemed to me that the what next, obviously your voice went down. So what next? So it was a bit unemotional. I, I, I would have loved a, a little bit earlier on in the story that he's eager to hear because why on earth does he continue and that storytelling one after the other. So but that's what's just my perception. Yeah, oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was wondering how that never ending story ha ha can have two like story has to end but also they can continue <laughs> so you have to like shift sometimes it's for the better and sometimes it's for the worse the 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 the, 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 the never ending story but it, really you 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 are very lively um telling the story it's very um, fresh in the sense that the humorous side is it's completely very, very good, really. Congratulations. I, I really liked it. Thank you so much. I watch a lot of um, videos on YouTube. And sometimes I get into a thing where I, I want to look at another one, another one, another one, but, but nothing is really interesting. But so I think I, I understand that feeling of um, wanting something, 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 and it's not, I'm not going to sleep yet. So I want something, but I, uh, but I, but I'm, I'm never satisfied. Eric, I have a recommendation. Try the website of the World Storytelling Institute. Okay, thank you. Wonderful <laughs> thank you very much. Good idea. Uh, uh, Shraddha? Yeah, Nidhi, I loved the way you added visualization to your story, right from the, you know, the healer or the, you know, who came in with recommendation. I could really picture him in my mind because you described him that his font was covered with this silken robe. It was really lovely visualization all through the story. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, shall we go on to the next story? Does anyone want to say anything else, or we'll go we'll go on? Okay, uh, Lokesh, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, please uh, introduce yourself and tell us about uh, uh, your connection with storytelling, and and please tell us a story. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Lokesh Kumar Mavila. I'm an advocate by profession. I, I practice at the Metal Psycho uh, presently. Um, my stink with storytelling uh, has a very long association uh, since my mom first told me her story from ancient Indian epics. I fell in love with the two major Indian epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. So I've grown up listening to her stories and moral values uh, since childhood. And that captivated me about, uh, more about understanding uh, kingdoms, uh, their rivalry, uh, the ancient morals and epics, and how uh, those are still applicable today, uh, despite changing times and circumstances. And excuse me, excuse me just a second. There's a, a little bit of talking in the background. Will it help if you close the door or, or something? Oh, uh, okay. My apologies. Just That's a second. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Just, can you just give me a second. Hmm.
Uh, my apologies. Uh, is it clear now? It's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So, as I was saying, so my strength with understanding stories was right from my childhood, and I fell in love with uh, different kind of stories, uh, right from epics to fiction to non-fiction. But the, but the most captivating among all these genres was uh, Indian mythological stories and uh, science fictions that I uh, frequently fell in love. So, uh, and that's how my strength with storytelling started. And this story that I'm going to narrate now is also uh, from the Mahabharata, one of the two major epics of India that we host Indians River and look to understanding the real moral values uh, every now and then. Even Bhagavad Gita is part of this major epic, uh, the discourse that Lord Krishna used to Arjuna. So my story is titled The Prince and the Naga Regnant. It's a small episode from the Mahabharata about the third Pandava prince, Arjuna, uh, accidentally meeting a Nagakanya, meaning uh, a water princess uh, uh, in, in an underworld water kingdom and marrying her uh, due to uh, certain strange circumstances. And their man, Arjuna, or neither the princess could have imagined. So the consequences were so Though it was a marriage that was uh, primarily based out of love, but their marriage couldn't sustain for long uh, due to many other factors that I'll be telling uh, in a few moments. At the same time, and how such a kind of marriage uh, could still instill a very great feeling of connection between two individuals, between two warriors uh, belonging to two different worlds with different upbringings and different ideologies. So fundamentally, the conversation that transpires between these two major characters uh, from the epic forms the crux of the story that I'm going to narrate now. Uh, hope I'm clear. I just gave a brief introduction as to what I'm trying to uh, convey uh, through my brief uh, story. So uh, this actually dates back to uh, the Dwapar Yuga. To be precise, it's more than 5,000 years ago uh, when the land of Bharat Varsha, or as you know, India, as you know today as it is India, uh, was ruled by many kingdoms and uh, uh, empires, among which the kingdom of Hastinapura was the most prosperous and powerful. And there was a sibling rivalry between uh, the Pandavas and the Kauravas. And the Pandavas had to create another capital called Indraprastha. Uh, the Pandavas were basically five brothers, among whom Arjuna was a, was a third brother. <laughs> So he was an excellent archer of his time, an unbeatable warrior, and also a man of very high uh, moral standing. But once, due to an unknown curse, a curse that was accidentally placed upon Arjuna, uh, he had to go on a pilgrimage all over India. So while he was traveling on this pilgrimage, he had to take a bath in the holy river, Ganga, and there was this underworld kingdom called the Ganga Nagas. The Nagas were actually a serpent race, a serpentine race that were living in the underworld water kingdom of the holy river Ganga. And there was a princess by name Ulupi. Uh, she was also known as Uluchi in certain texts. Uh, this water princess or the Naga princess uh, falls in love with Arjuna at first sight and she she kidnaps him after seeing him. So when Arjuna was bathing in the river Ganga, this Naga princess by name Ulupi uh, uh, kidnaps Arjuna and takes him uh, to, to, to her underworld kingdom. And the conversation begins now as to why did she kidnap him and what is, she, what is it that she actually wants from him. So the present story that I'm going to begin now is a conversation that transpires between these two characters, between Arjuna and Uluchi in her world, in her underworld water kingdom. So it might look strange that uh, a mortal uh, getting kidnapped by uh, another uh, being who is neither a human nor a serpent. She's actually a, a Naga princess. So she's actually half human and half serpent. That's her physical appearance uh, going by the Indian texts. 
so the conversation that actually happens between them begins when arjuna regains consciousness in her kingdom he sees around this beautiful uh, decorations he's lying on the bed and he's he's is completely confused and then he sees the princess standing over there and asks who are you and why did you bring me here she says that's a very usual question i didn't expect that from a warrior uh, whom the world admires him to be the greatest archer he said surprising okay okay you might know i'm arjuna but i actually don't know you i never seen you before so what is it that you actually want from me that you brought me here uh, when i am on a journey i want a pilgrimage journey uh, you know to some other kingdoms she bluntly says that i have fallen in love with you and i want to marry you arjuna says no this cannot happen because uh, i have taken a note that as long as i cannot finish my pilgrimage i cannot marry any woman and that's my oath and i have to keep my oath at all costs okay but your oath is only limited to your first wife that you have given her that you won't marry uh, during the period of pilgrimage but that oath doesn't apply to me because i'm neither a human i'm neither a serpent so you ought to marry me because i've fallen in love with you arjuna still declines and says no this cannot happen because i don't think how marriage can result in a fruitful union because uh, you belong to a different world i belong to a different world uh, we both are uh, different beings by thinking and by appearances he says if we, if if i'm the disease you can never be the medicine and the princess or gives the medicine is always supposed to cure it cannot enhance the disease so if you if you understand that you're the disease because you have a lot of responsibilities to carry on then i can be the cure for your disease i can act as it may i do not surprise that a princess from an underworld water kingdom could argue in such a way because she has never encountered somebody who could actually uh, argue so diligently at the same time in a very convincing manner but still it doesn't apply he says look i'm actually a warrior and i have got a lot of responsibilities i might die at any point of time because my job is a kshatriya and going by indian uh, uh, social uh, social hierarchies the kshatriya is basically a warrior group and they're supposed to defend the kingdom or they need to serve the king loyally as military commanders so arjuna being a kshatriya by blood has to always engage in wars and the least he cares about what is about his family or about himself all he needs to do is to dedicate his entire life for the welfare of his subjects and the kingdom and that's what he's supposed to do he says if i were to marry you i don't think i'll be in a position to uh, look after you very well at the same time i don't think i can even survive <laughs> given the intensity of battles that i am fighting uh, at that juncture but still the princess is very adamant and she says no if there's one ambition in life that always nurtured i want to get married to one of the greatest starkers in the entire world knows and that's you and nothing in this world can change my decision as well and even if you stand head on heels to say no to me or no to my decision i still propose to marry you because it's your job as a warrior as a kshatriya to always fulfill the subject's duties because even my kingdom falls under your empire under your kingdom and you're supposed to even satisfy my request and my proposal and hence you ought to marry me at any cost arjuna still wants to inquire more about her background and her upbringing so he kept, he keeps on pestering her by asking questions as to what is exactly is your background and why do you think you are right fit to marry me because i'm just a mortal i don't belong to your race i don't belong to your clan i don't know anything about how your race and clan functions in war because my style of fighting is different from your style of fighting because each clan each community and each race has a different way of uh, challenging and countering warfare systems back then so arjuna knew a particular technique which the princess might not know or the vice versa could apply so he wants to know more about the princess background and why she so adamant on marrying only at only him when there were other uh, great warriors from other clans and communities so the princess says look there's only one thing that i always have i know akhir and there are only two people on this earth 
that can rival me in Akhari. One is you, and the other is the Supreme God of it, Krishna. So Krishna has already been married to many wives, so that's impossible. And he's your close friend, and you're a disciple of Lord Krishna. So the best factors, I need to marry you. Not because I need to learn Akhari from you, because my love is so great that nothing in this world or no force in this world can stop me from getting married. Because it's a woman uh, from a different clan, from a different world, is proposing to a mortal man whom she has kidnapped and says, it's my ambition to marry you. And I have no, I've got no other ambition. And I won't be in a position to accept any other reply except you say yes to my proposal. So the, so the fun fact here is, Arjuna has never seen this woman before. Arjuna never knew about this woman before, but the woman knew each and every background, every information about Arjuna. And she has been trying to convince him to marry him all along. So the biggest hindrance that Arjuna has to face right now is to choose about marrying this woman. And if he has to marry this woman, he cannot live with her for so long because he, is, he has to carry on with his pilgrimage. And also he has to go for war, which he has been preparing all along, along with his brothers. And there's no guarantee that if he has to enter war, then he would be alive. He will come back alive. So the biggest dilemma that Arjuna has been facing is to understand how and why this woman can get convinced not to marry me. And that's the reason he has been trying to find out as to what questions that I can pose or what answers can she give that can make me entirely convinced to uh, not marry me. Or if at all I had to marry her, the moral dilemma that exists between us. And right now he questions and says, the princess has chosen the wrong path because even if I were to marry the princess, all I can do is to only spend a night with you and then I have to leave at all costs. So the princess will obviously be at an advantage by marrying a warrior like me because I can't commit myself to you all my life because I'm just a mortal and I've never proposed to you. It's you who have been proposing to marry me. And I can't give you that marital life that you expect from Lisa. But the princess is still adamant. She just says, it's enough if you can just spend one night with you. Right? Because all I care is just one night of union with you and nothing else. I know you've got other responsibilities. I know your biggest responsibility is to fight the war on behalf of your brothers and for your kingdom. But I'll always be in service to you. I'll always be of help to you. I'll always confer boons when and where required. I'll always stand by you as a faithful and loyal wife. She says, if there's one thing that only that can only distance with you and me, it's only your greed for kingdoms. Because you fight for your kingdom, I protect my clan for the sake of my father's world that I've given to you. So you and I have shared the amb same ambition, but in a different worlds and different upbringings. Because you fight for the welfare of your subjects and your brothers. I fight to defend my clan's enemies. By strength, we're equal. By duties, we are still equal. And by responsibilities, we're more than equal. So I don't think there can be any other convincing reason as we are both a trained warriors and also uh, a person specializing in astrological science to understand the future of a particular person's fate. So what more responsibilities and qualifications do I need to have to marry you? Do I belong to a different world? Arjuna gradually gets convinced and finally he says, look, there's only one possibility that I can have to marry you now. And if I have to marry you now, it's not my ambition, it's not my greed to fight for the kingdom, it's not wealth, it's not my inherent desire to protect my brothers that comes between you and me. I can never, never come back and look at you because once I leave, I'll never get back to you again. Come what me, because I have a lot of responsibilities and I don't know where you, where will you even live in this underworld kingdom once I leave. But if there's anything that I can do to you, I can always be a husband as you expect me to be, loyal and faithful because I'm also married to some other woman. So I cannot take you as the one and only wife, uh, you know, in a strange world when you kidnap me and ask me for my proposal. But still the princess remains adamant and says, even if I have to die for you, I don't care. Even if I have to sacrifice my progeny for you, I still don't mind. Even if I have to sacrifice my entire kingdom and my wealth, I wouldn't mind because all I demand from you is your unwavering love and affection. So with these words, Arjuna gets convinced and they marry. And they marry with great pomp and plunder in her own kingdom. 
but Arjuna is still adam- but Arjuna is still confused as to how can he address uh, her or contact her once he leaves. And with the one night of union, a child is born to them by name Arama. And it is this child that protects Arjuna by sacrificing his life at the Kurikshetra battle. But Arjuna has to leave as promised. And before leaving, his wife Ulichi guarantees him a boon and says that even if you were to fight in water, I give you a boon that no water, no creature born on water or no water creature can do you any harm. And that's the only boon he receives from his wife uh, to remain invincible while fighting in water. And once a child is born to them, Arjuna leaves never to come back. But Ulichi still keeps dreaming and still keeps uh, her memories about Arjuna very fond to her. And she brings up her son with the same value and the same courage as like a father. So the small conversation or episode that transpires between Arjuna uh, and Uluchi after spending a night with her and he leaves to carry on with his pilgrimage is the crux of the prince, the Arjuna, the prince and the Naga, Naga regnant. Uh, the, the Naga princess by name Uluchi. Uh, and then the rest is history because Arjuna has to go back and fight the Kurukshetra along with his brothers and Krishna. And the same follows. So in the world where we talk about women empowerment and feminism and all such kind of stuff. So there is this woman who is lesser known, who has been given lesser significance and importance, even in the main uh, tale of Mahabharata, uh, who stood by her husband, despite all odds, who sacrificed her own son to protect her husband's uh, life. At the same time, she never expected anything from her husband, uh, though uh, uh, he has left her and never to return back. At the end of the day, all she expected was his unwavering love and commitment towards her. And that's what a true woman, a true wife, and a true lover stood for a man for whom she has sacrificed everything and is willing to do everything at any point of time. Uh, That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, ladies, what, what do you think about this? <laughs> Very intense story, Lokesh. And I have not heard this, this particular conversation story in my hearings of the Mahabharata. So it was a new story for me. Very interesting. Thank you. And a very tall order of not just for the woman, but for the man too. Why, why for the man? Well, he promises to be devoted and loyal. I think that's a tall order for anyone nowadays, maybe. It's something that you have to intensely believe in to make happen. So I think that's the intensity of the story that comes through. He'll, he'll be devoted even though he can never visit her again? That, that's what I'm saying is a tall order. Hmm. But he never had time to visit her again, sir, because once he left, uh, it was Zulupi who ran to Arjuna again uh, after sacrificing her son uh, because she wanted to see Arjuna after the battle, after the final battle. And that was when Arjuna embraces Zulupi for all the sacrifices she has made. For him. And he never returned back. And as per the tale uh, of the epic, Zulupi uh, goes back to her kingdom and Arjuna uh, dies later on. I mean, the, the, the Yuga ends, the, 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 the Arjuna. Uh, Avatar ends. That's that's the end of the day. But what what happens to the son? Oh, uh, son, son, he dies in the battle. What happens is, uh, you know, there's a very deadly curse upon Arjuna. Mm-hmm. Uh, Arjuna has to die in war because he has unethically killed his grandsire Bhishma. Mm. So Ulupi, upon coming to know about this fact, sacrifices her son to protect Arjuna's life. Mm. His son, by name Aravan, knows very well that he's going to die in the battle but he was more than happy to die in the battle to protect his father. And that's exactly what Ulupi wanted. Arjuna never knew this fact that there was a warrior by name Aravan uh, who was actually his son born to Ulupi. And this he comes to know after the battle ended. So if Arjuna was alive, it was the sacrifices of, you know, many great warriors, including his son, uh, you know, uh, who had to protect him from these kind of deadly curses. And that's the reason why Arjuna still stood alive after the great battle. We all know about Abhimanyu as to how Abhimanyu was unethically killed. And when Arjuna took revenge, 
but hardly anyone knew about this uh, Naga prince's son by name Harawan, who actually had to sacrifice himself uh, to protect his father. And there was no other way to protect Rajin other than sacrificing his life. And still his mother, uh, Ulupi, was okay with that because she was more devoted to Arjuna. She never even thought for a moment of even sacrificing her own son to protect her husband. And then Arjuna lived for, for a long time after that? Yes, yes. And that was when he regarded Ulupi as the, the, the real woman, uh, as a real wife, uh, you know, in comparison to his other wives, because she has done the supreme sacrifice that no woman would do. Mm-hmm. All he did, all, all that Arjuna did was to just spend a night with her and then he left her. He didn't even contribute anything to their marital life, but still Ulupi held no vengeance, no revenge against Arjuna. She just loved him unconditionally. She just stood by him during all odds. She just supported him as a loyal wife. And all she expected at the end of the day was his love. That's it. She never asked for being a princess. She never asked for being as a queen. She never asked for being, uh, uh, you know, she never demanded wealth, kingdoms, and all such kind of sort. All she said was, all I need is your love. That's it. And she felt that he, he gave it to her, even though he, he, only, yes. he was only with her for one day. Yes. And that's the reason why Arjuna says, if I had to ever have one wife like Ulupi, I think uh, I would have never married Draupadi or even Shupatra. You know, if I had known that there was a woman who stood by, who stood by me like Ulupi. And, and, he, and he knew that very late because he never knew that it was Ulupi all along who played the game by, by, by you know, uh, sacrificing so much for it. And, 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 even, and even expecting nothing in return. So... So I mean, in the cool. in the epic, uh, Arjuna's uh, fate is is so uh, affected by things that are out of his control. Uh, somebody curses him. Uh, that's uh, th- that's a, a, a negative thing. But then this this otherworldly female falls in love with him, and uh, and and helps him. So these. Um, these things come up that help him or hinder him, but uh, they're sort of beyond his control. Yes, you know, to be uh, to be blunt, it was Ulupi was an armor that protected Arjuna. She was an armor, a divine armor that protected Arjuna. If Arjuna had to die, mm-hmm. Ulupi had to die first. But Ulupi ensured that by sacrificing everything under her disposal, she still made Arjuna mm-hmm. live. So such was the great love she had towards Arjuna which no other wife, including Draupadi or even Shubhadra had, you know, such kind of unconditional love uh, towards Arjuna. Which son, though yes, I agree, Shubhadra even lost her son in the battle. Mm. And Draupadi even lost her sons in the battle. The fact is, uh, she took upon the deadly curse upon herself. And she made a supreme decision to sacrifice everything to protect Arjuna. If not for, if not for Ulupi, Arjuna would have been dead long back. So these invisible forces are uh, are affecting his Arjuna's life so much. Yes, yes, and that's the reason why even Krishna says that uh, you know uh, after after understanding the kind of love and devotion uh, Ulupi had towards Arjuna, he says uh, the, the the biggest asset that a man like you or a warrior can like you can earn is not winning battles or is not winning fame, is to win the love and affection of a woman who stands by you, uh, even in the face of death, and even if she has to face death at any cost. And that's the greatest moral or ethic that a woman uh, who still demands unwavering love from husband, but whether he gives it or not is relevant. And Rajna realizes it at a very later point in time, but still uh, he understands the kind of sacrifice after the great battle. If he, were, if he was alive, he has to owe it to his life and existence was owed to Lupi, and that's the reason why uh, he uh, makes such a statement that if I had to have one wife like you, I think I'd have won the entire world, or I'd have conquered the entire world, you standing beside me. And sadly, this small episode or tale of Lupi is lesser told, and nobody knows much about it. So I thought it's a tale that needs to be told, a story that needs attention. Uh, uh, a kind of model that needs to be expounded to the larger section of people because we talk about feminism and empowerment today. I think that's where 
the real uh, the women empowerment or the virtue of women stands very tall and well but i think i think we men should uh, also aspire to um support and sacrifice for for our for our wives also <laughs> yeah if if that can be then we would see a we would definitely see a better society with strong familial values rooted in our indian culture i'm looking forward to that day <laughs> so <laughs> i mean if 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 the moral can be uh, rightly grasped in the right i mean in, in the correct sense so i think we will definitely have a very strong uh, familial uh, uh, you know connections towards our families or extended families and we can build a strong bonding with our own people and uh, our own family members okay and anyone else any thoughts before we go on mhm mm uh veena did you want to say something you're on mute like to we like to know where to read the story uh ma'am actually uh the story is not available anywhere uh you know in any books but the fact is i gathered it out of my own research after you know talking to many people uh, after after understanding it from many uh, folk tales local folk tales in south india uh, actually i'm writing a book on this particular episode it's 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 still under process so i felt this particular story needs to be told because of a woman who takes on everything all she does is only for the love towards her husband towards a man simple there's, there's nothing beyond this i'm ready to sacrifice okay everything but if he lives that's enough for me and and that's when he he never realized the fact that there's a woman who's standing behind you in an invisible manner protecting you from all odds and ends of situations so i felt this is a story or moral that we need to take away uh, given the present uh, scenarios in changing circumstances i'm writing a book but there's no one single uh, uh, you know source that i can tell you from where you can find this story Uh, but there's a very small mention of uh, this particular woman called Vulupi uh, from the original, uh, you know, uh, 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 the the Vedas as Mahabharata. Uh, but he hasn't expounded it much. He hasn't elaborated it much. But various folk tales have been derived. So I've I've actually referred a lot of sources. So I've been trying to consolidate and you know write it into one single format. Uh, once I think the book is ready, then it will be in the public domain and. A lot of people can know about this woman, the lesser-known character in Mahabharata, uh, who is also wife like of Arjuna. Yes. Well, I sense uh, the women have uh, have a lot to say about this, but uh, but maybe we'll they'll, 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 you know, we'll say it later. <laughs> sure. But I I think we can all agree it should be a it should be a two-way street that uh, the the same devotion should be on both sides. Yes. Great. but but sadly but sadly there's even a mention it says uh, the devotion or the loyalty to the wife can even change an erring husband you know that's how uh, some of the vedas describe it mm -hmm. you know the other the other counter that we always have is we're not saying everybody is perfect they might have their own flaws and deficiencies as such but the unwavering love the unconditional support the affection that they uh, give to you can even change uh, your heart or you can even melt your heart and that's what to be exactly did and even a warrior like arjuna actually had to bend for her love uh, you know <laughs> very good okay thank you very much thank you shraddha are you ready i think so okay you're going to tell a different kind of traditional story a different kind of traditional story yes yes so please introduce yourself and uh, tell us about your work and please tell us a story So my name is Shraddha Nigvekar, and I'm a storyteller from Pune. I'm also an English facilitator and a performing arts facilitator at a school for primary children and middle school children. I also am a host of a storytelling channel called Katha by Shraddha. And um, just like one of the tellers before me, Nidhi, um, this is one of my first forays into telling for adults. So I hope you enjoy this story. मेरे साथ आओ मेरे दोस्तों एक किस्सा सुनो मेरे साथ आओ मेरे दोस्तों एक किस्सा सुनो 
Come with me, come with me, my dear, dear friends. Let's listen to a story. So once upon a time, a really long time ago, there lived two women who were really, really good friends. They were so close to each other, they were like family. And these two women were just very beautiful women, inside and out. They were just so pretty, so pretty, and so gorgeous. They lived outside a village in a small hut, near a village, but near the forest too that was outside the village. And they used to have fruit trees and grow their own vegetables, and they were pretty self-sufficient. Now, one day, one of the women felt very sad because something was niggling at her, something was bothering her. And her friend, the second woman noticed this and she said, my dear friend, what is bothering you? Why are you so sad? And she said, well, I know we both are beautiful, but I don't know which one is prettier. I want to know which of the two of us is more beautiful. And at that time, there was no looking glass or mirror to ask the question, you know, mirror, mirror on the wall kind of thing. This was not, there was no mirror available. So she said, I have an idea. What if, what if we had a competition? What if we went into that village one at a time and of the villagers, whoever gets the maximum following, we have to admit that she is the prettier one. Would you, would you compete with this? And the second woman said, okay, <laughs> I, I really don't care who is prettier, but if it's really bothering you so much, sure, let's have this competition. I don't mind. So the first woman said, okay, I'll go first. And she goes towards the village and there's a big arc outside the village that shows that this is the entrance to the village. And she puts one foot in and she just quietly observes what's going on in the village. And there's this huge banyan tree on the right-hand side near, this, near the entrance to the village, where there's a whole bunch of old gentlemen sitting. Some are playing cards, some are drinking some coffee or tea, some are, you know, uh, smoking the hookah. The others are just looking up, like lying down on their backs and looking up at the tree. And then she puts another foot in. And when she puts that other foot in, one of the old men noticed her and he just looks at her and then he tells his friends around him, whispers to them and they rush across the street to the other side of the street where there are a bunch of children playing. It's evening time and there are a bunch of children playing over there and they grab those children's hands and they drag them away from this woman and they all go inside their houses. And this woman is very surprised, saying, why are, they, why are they all moving away from me? Why are they running away from me? But she said, she thinks, let me go in, in a little bit further. So she steps further in, and she comes across this bunch of women, villager women, who are chit-chatting with each other, you know, talking about how their day was, what they're going to make for dinner, and, you know, just chit-chatting about, about general things in life. And when these women notice her, they too put their hands up to their face and they rush inside their houses and they slam the door shut and they make sure all their children are inside, safe. And this woman doesn't know what to do. And there are a whole bunch of men coming back from the daily chores in the fields and coming back towards their houses and they too rush inside their houses. And she doesn't understand why is everyone running away from her? Is she really that ugly? Why does she have this effect on people? And then on a, from a distance, she sees the one man who's a straggler who's still coming home. And she thinks, you know, no one will be able to resist naked skin. So she does the unthinkable and she drops her robes. And to her shock, even in spite of this, that one man just shrieks and he runs home and shuts the door and shuts the windows of the house. And by now, this first woman, she's really, really upset and she's tears rolling down her eyes. And she's like, why is everyone shunning me? Everyone is running away from me. So she just runs back home in tears and really, really upset. And her friend sees her coming and she 
ushers and inside the asking, what happened? What happened? Why stop sit here? Take this glass of water. And the first woman just pushes that glass aside and says, no, no, I'm just so upset. Everybody, everybody ran away from me. I know I'm so pretty and beautiful. Why is everyone shunning me? Why? Why? And the, the second woman says, calm down, calm down. Let's think about this. No, no, I don't want to calm down. I cannot calm down until you finish your part of the competition. You must go now and you must experience what I experienced. So the second friend, the second friend says, okay, okay, if this is the only thing that's going to calm you down, I will go and let's see what happens. So the second woman goes towards that ark, which is the entrance of the village. And by now everyone has come back to their regular positions. The old men are sitting on the tatta around, around the banyan tree and they're chit-chatting and playing cards and just having a generally nice evening. The children are back across the street playing you know, jumping hoops and playing. The women are out in the street again, talking to each other. And the men are lounging around having some tea. Everyone is back on the streets and out and about. And the second woman puts one foot in. And, and then she puts another foot in. And, 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 as soon as she puts that musical foot in, the old woman, all, all, the old men all turn as one to look at her. And they have wonder in their eyes and a huge smile on their faces. And they're so joyful. And they cross the street and hold the children's hands, this time not to run away, but to make a circle around the second woman and sing and dance and just be joyful around her. And she walks in a little further with this circle of admirers around her. When the women see her, the women that are chit-chatting, and, and, and the women, the women burst into smiles and they rush home, but not to shut the doors and the windows. They come out bearing gifts for this woman. They come out bearing fresh fruit and sweets and savories and offer, all offerings for this second woman. And she takes a sweet from one and a piece of spicy thing from another and takes a little bit of fruit from the third. And she continues walking. And then the men who are lounging around see her and they all join the crowd singing and dancing and they go through one bylane of the village and then another bylane of the village and all around collecting people as she went. And they're all thronging around her and, and even from a distance, this first woman can see in the village all the dust that is rising because of all of these people that are dancing and singing and she can hear the notes of the music that's being played. And she's in shock. She's like, this friend of mine, how is she having such a different experience? What's going on? And she just can't wait until her friends come back, until her friend comes back. And her friend then completes the whole village tour and she comes back home with people still singing and dancing and she leaves them behind her and she says, okay, I have to go now. And she comes home. And just as she enters home, her friend pulls her in and says, tell me, tell me, why are they welcoming you with open arms and they shun me? Am I so ugly? I look just like you. Why? Why would they shun me? And her friend said, Sit down. Let me tell you. Would you like me to tell you what she said? Would you like to know? Moira says yes. All right. Yes. So the second woman said, my dear friend, you are the truth and I am story. And people have a really difficult time facing the truth and even a, so much more a tough time facing the naked truth but when it is adorned with a story people are more accepting and welcoming and they welcome you with open arms and and truth is just she just can't believe it she says how can that be truth is reality how can people not accept reality this is this is what it is they have to accept the truth and a friend says, come, let me show you. 
and she takes her into her room and she opens her very favorite treasure chest and from there she takes out some things to adorn the truth she takes out a beautiful necklace and she puts it in her neck and she takes out some beautiful earrings and she puts it in her ears and truth is then adorned and then she takes a beautiful ring and she puts it on truth it says now come back with me to the village not in front of me and not behind me let us walk hand in hand and go into that village and let's see what happens and truth walks with story hand in hand just right by her side and they walk inside and as they put one foot in chan and then another foot in chan 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 and the old men look at both of them and the children look at both of them and they all gather around both of these women and they start singing and dancing and they're all very joyful and the women join in and the men join in and there's so much joy in that village and finally truth is happy and since then story has always walked hand in hand with the truth and that is how truth is accepted in the world that was the story called truth and story it is a very old folk tale and it has been told in many forms and formats in many parts of the world and i heard it for the first time from one of my gurus in storytelling her name is yogita ahuja so i'd like to say thank you to yogita for sharing this story with me and giving me permission to share it all thank you there's beautiful story nice build up too yes well you know we have 26 people in this meeting but only a couple of us have our cameras on could 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 uh, some some people turn their cameras on just for a couple of minutes just to to uh, engage in a little discussion great great so this is a this was an allegory, I think it's sometimes okay. called, right? It was a beautiful a, story a, about. Hmm. Can I speak? Go, go ahead. Yeah, beautiful story about the power of storytelling, and I must compliment the way in which you told it. Hmm. Okay, Thank with you the so visual much. aids, the audio aids, <laughs> very engagingly told. Thank I you. must say, I enjoyed that story thoroughly. That's why storytelling has continued till this day not just in forums like the wonderful forum Eric provides for us, but all our religions and our, you know, uh, social customs and all are built around stories which have endured till this day. Thank you. Thank you, Bhaisa. Maura? Yeah, and uh, Shada, I, I love the way you told that story. I think it's the one of the first stories I ever heard as, as a obvious parable, and it was maybe three or at the most five minutes long. And what you made out of it was so wonderful. I mean, not that, that and there's nothing wrong with the short version, but you brought into this also this psychology you know feeling rejected i i felt so much with the with the characters as if they were true human beings so you 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 added something very human to it and and the end when you put the jewelry on you know it was mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderfully done. I've never heard that. I've heard that story frequently, but never like that. So thank, thank you. Barbara. Thank you so much. Yes, Strada, you gave uh, you gave justice to um, to the emotions of the characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was good acting. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, it was, I, I hope I did justice to the way Yogita told it to me the first time. I was just so captivated by her telling and I hope I did, did at least half the job that she did when she told me the story. So all thanks to her. <laughs> Thank you. So this is an allegory, right? It's, uh, it's allegory. Allegory. Okay. Allegory. Uh, an allegory is... Um... I guess a story where the characters represent uh, 
represent ideas or th mm -hmm. represent things. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Eric, I just want to answer one question that's coming in the chat. Mm. So Priya said she missed the reason uh, of, of why the other woman was rejected. Mm. So at the end, Priya, uh, the second woman explains to her friend who was rejected by all the village folk that, my friend, you are the truth and I am story. And people don't want to face the truth directly face to face and more so the naked truth. They get just scared by it. And that's why they were running away from you. But when truth is adorned by a story, it's more... Uh, palatable and, and more acceptable. And uh, since then, they, they walked hand in hand and wherever story went, um, truth went along. I sometimes, hope that answers your question. Sometimes it's told where the, the two characters are truth and beauty. Hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Beauty is truth and truth is beauty. Well, the, the truth has to be the truth has to be told in a beautiful way. <laughs> Which Shraddha did. Yes. Great. It was a beautiful story, Shraddha. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you. Okay, Mani, are you are you ready? Are you are you there? You are. Is your mic on? Yes, uh, Eric. Am I audible? Great. You are. Okay, Mani, please uh, introduce yourself and. Uh, Tell us about your connection with storytelling and um, please tell us the story. Uh, 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 good evening, uh, good morning to the audience came here to listen to the stories which we are serving in this evening in India. So I'm joining from Chennai. So I'm a student of uh, uh, Eric Miller. So this is my fourth or third storytelling before the world audience. So, uh, so I'm very happy and delighted to be in this forum. Uh, so the story is about is a true story. So I the true, true story it is about my journey. The journey is about overcoming a challenge. So I've taken this challenge to overcome uh, the tough journey. So the story goes like this. This is a, I will call this as a trekking. Also, I would like to tell that this will be taken as a pilgrim also. So I was preparing for this trekking that night. I was packing my bag with too many dresses. So I was, packing my bag and I was checking the weight of the bag. Then, uh, you know one thing, this is the first time I'm climbing this mountain. I've climbed several mountains in the past. I've trekked, but this is the first time I'm climbing this mountain. This is very new. This is going to be a very new experience for me. After COVID, we stopped moving. We were inside our house, so we never explore uh, in, in, in our life. So uh, after a long break, we, a small group of friends are starting this journey towards a mountain. A mountain is at Tiruvannamalai. Uh, the, the name of the mountain is Parvadamala. Parvadamalai, uh, 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 otherwise called as King of Mountains. So, why I like mountain, why I like to climb mountain is when I climb mountain, I can hear my inner voice from the start to the end, from the foothill to the top and again to the foothill. I can hear my inner voice in a loud way very loud voice inside me. Now and then I, I'll hear, hey, it's not possible. It is difficult. It is a painful process. There will be a lot of hurdles. You will definitely struggle. And you may hit uh, your foot in the rock. 
you may break your bone you may fall down from mountain so those are all the voice i hear in me and i wanted a mind like a mountain which is unshakable a strong mountain like mind i want so mind used to be wavering i want a still mind i want a strong unshakable mind we started our journey next day morning i woke up early and i told bye to my father and mother and i started my journey i boarded a bus after few kilometers another friend joined me in bus so we started together and we got dropped near kundratur from there we did a small warm up exercise we walked barefoot and we we reached kundratur and we completed our break first then from there uh, another friend joined he came with a car so uh, all three are going in the car so they were all speaking about uh, ancient tamil literature poetry about god but you know me right i was sleeping so i was sleeping all through the journey they were all speaking with full of passion and they were all praises for the poems the saints something i felt difficult so i i was sleeping so i was also thinking about the inner voices which are coming now and then how are you going to do this how are you going to complete this journey so we reached kanchipuram in kanchipuram another person joined us so we bought some puja uh, items and we stored in our dikki and then again started our journey we reached tiruvannamalai uh, and we were near the foothill parvathamalai then they woke me up hey come on watch the mountain i woke up and i saw it is a completely different mountain i have not seen such a kind of mountain why because after some point there is a sudden cliff top at the top of the mountain it is so steep before going i was exploring in youtube that is other story but when i saw it in my eyes that was a shock to me this is going to be a very new experience in my life especially in trekking when we reached the foothill we changed our costumes and we were stretching our leg like this and inside me i was shaking and I, 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 i was not showing outside my friends were joining me and we uh, faced uh, washed our face and we started walking uh, when we walked one of one dog was accompanying us we fed that dog by giving biscuits and then uh, we saw one herd serving hut serving teas we we had teas tea there chai and we saw six cats in that house they were accommodating uh, six cats okay so that that was a new thing for me uh, we saw dog we saw uh, cat and a small passage took us to the mountain i started stepping up rock stones one after the other i saw small rock stones and it was becoming big 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 and i was climbing started climbing the mountain started feeling the weight heaviness of my back so i was slowly walking up and at one point in time i was perspiring i was gasping for air i was not showing how tired and i i, I felt difficult to walk further and after some time i stopped walking my friends felt that i am struggling to walk further and they also slowed down and they waited for me and to reduce the heaviness of the ba- uh, bag i started distributing the food items i was 
storing in my bag. So there were dates, dry fruits, sweets, mitais were there. So I started distributing. So, uh, and we are also uh, carrying a bag full of uh, puja items, banana leaves. Again, we started climbing. Suddenly we saw two monkeys watching us. They were hungry and thirsty. They were watching us carrying banana leaves. They wanted to grab those banana leaves and they wanted food from us. It is so sacred, right? Sacred, right? For puja items. So we were holding it like this and uh, walking up. Monkeys were following and they were chasing, uh, uh, chasing us. And one point in time, they grabbed that banana leaf. One of my friends, he became monkey. Wah! Wah! He shouted at that monkey. By seeing my friend becoming a, a King Kong, I was feared. Am I traveling with a friend or with a monkey? He is very terrifying when compared to that monkey. What happened to my friend? And we took one stick to beat monkey. So when we take the stick, it will go away. That's what we thought. But it chased us for another 30 minutes for food. Uh, that gave me a fear along with a lot of breathing. After half an hour, so all those half an hour, I was watching monkey, whether it is following me or it has gone. So after one hour, the route turned its way. And now I looked up. I saw mountain in a different form. There were boulders, there were iron bars in the mountain. It is not only steep, now it is very difficult to step up. I hold it, the iron bolter, and started walking up. It is so difficult now, and I don't think I can complete this journey. That's what I hear in me. When we stopped in one place, my friend joked, hey, why don't we take a selfie now? I asked him, is this the time to take selfie? Do you think I can pose for selfie? Hey, I'm struggling to walk, man. I'm gasping for air. How can you ask me to smile for a selfie? Let's walk up. Come on. Let's go. And again, we started. I saw this side, a beautiful scene. And this side, danger. And at that moment, a philosophical thought came into my mind. How come a nature can be both beautiful at the same time dangerous? So that hit me and I decided, my inner voice said, how will you cross this place when the sun is set when there is no light, how will you come across this sudden deep falls? There is edges nearby me. If I step that side, I may fall down. It's so deep. I was thinking, how am I going to climb down when it is dark? Then sudden, immediately asked my friend, how many of you are carrying torchlight? None were carrying torchlight, but we discussed to carry torchlight. Inside me, I was telling, my inner voice was telling, you are safe because you are carrying a torchlight. So I didn't tell my friends I'm carrying a torchlight. So I'm happy. And again, we walked up. After three hours of journey, we climbed to the cliff top and cliff top, I said, no, it's a steep mountain. 
again bolters bolters and chains were uh, attached for to each bolters so i was holding it tightly if i miss it i may fall down and i break i can break my bone i was also thinking am i a burden inside me i was telling am i a burden to my friends am i going to trouble them in this journey am i slowing down their journey but they were not complaining about me they were telling don't panic don't look up also don't look down concentrate every step that was the message i got from my friends so again i was holding the iron bolter tightly and i reached the top of the mountain in some places i saw deep fall after 4 hours of our journey we reached the top we completed our puja at the top we felt breeze hugging us it is 4500 feet height we saw sun nearby us it was a nice moment for all of us at that time i didn't hear any inner voice the moment we, our friends told we have to come down we have to climb down again the inner voice started are you going to climb down is it possible there will be monkeys which will disturb your journey there will not be any water during your journey all your food are exhausted your resources are exhausted but you have torch light with you you can climb down so when it was 6 pm we started climbing down i said no it was a deep steep cliff top you have to climb down the staircases also will be steep so you have to hold it tightly and you have to step down fortunately i didn't fall i didn't miss those iron bolters with a sense of fear i climbed down then we can't continue to walk down it was becoming dark and i'm not able to see anything so my inner voice told take out your torch light so i took my torch light inserted newly bought uh, battery and i tried switching on oh what it is not working no light is coming from this torch light oh my god how oh, am i going to climb down i think it's going to be very difficult my friend suggested yes i have a torch light with this torch light we can climb down okay we will do that so it is not advisable to walk with one torch light because if you step this side there is a deep uh, fall so you should you cannot walk together in that uh, uh, mountain path one after the other only you have to walk we we tried our best and i saw other two friends using their mobile phone torch light with the mobile phone torch light also they are walking but i saw my mobile phone torch light mobile phone showing only 35% my inner voice told me what if your charge goes down how can you call your family no no not to use now i you, uh, with the help of my friends torch light i climbed down for another half an hour and i really felt difficult because i thought that i am risking my life so i took out my phone torch light with the help of my phone torch light i further climbed down and we were reaching 
the foothills. My friends were telling we have to catch bus. So from uh, we we lost our path. So from there we have to go to other place. When I came down, I didn't see any dangerous things, horrible things. It's only dark, and this mobile torch light helped me climb down without any bruises, hurts. In your journey, there will be a lot of things you may come up, struggles, pain, your inner voice especially. Beyond all these things, you should move on. You should continue your journey. When I finished the journey, I saw people climbing without torchlight also. In this dark night, they are climbing the mountain without torchlight. I will never say, don't climb at the torchlight at this moment. Don't climb the mountain at this moment without a torchlight. Because in all my life, from my school to the college, to the office, people in the form of advice and suggestions are feeding our inner voice. This is your life. This is my life. I wanted to explore this life, this journey. And I remember those like-minded friends who were giving their voice when I was in struggle, when I was in the difficult phase of my life. Over to you, Eric. Okay. Thank you very much. So you, there, there were uh, the, the, both positive and negative inner voices. Yes. 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 Some of the inner voices were saying, you can do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I saw how... Um, how happy you were to have that flashlight and then how disappointed when it didn't work. That's a twist in the tail. Mm. But luckily your friends had something and uh, you could work as a team. Yeah. So obviously climbing this mountain was a very meaningful symbolic thing for you. Right? Absolutely. It was a it, 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 like you said at the beginning, you, you, wanted, you want to be as strong and solid as, as that mountain. Yes. So, uh, so now after, after you, after you, uh, you know, made that, that trick, now do you, do you feel stronger? Do you, do, 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 do you feel different? I wanted to trek again. That's my reply, Eric. You want to go there again? Yeah. So we plan to go to another mountain. Uh -huh. So I, uh, it's it's continuous thing. So when you go, you get something, and with that we you can sustain you can be sustaining, and again you have to restore some character. So, mm -hmm. so the struggles, the process may build some muscle. So that's what I think. Mm -hmm. It may not be true also. But that's my that's my feeling. I like that feeling. Mm -hmm. well, some people get into mountain climbing and it, it's a very um, meaningful thing for them. Uh, Ayushi? Yes, sir. So I wanted to say that when I heard his travel story, it reminded me of a scene, a clip from one of my movies, which I'd seen, one of the movies. It was either Kung Fu Panda 1 or 2, I don't remember which, but there was this really beautiful dialogue. It was in the second film. It's like when you believe in yourself, you can change your destiny. So it's like the Kung Fu Panda warrior, the dragon warrior and his friends were on a journey to Gongmin city to stop an evil peacock. 
from destroying the entire city and its region so mm. when they are fighting it is heard that the dragon warrior realizes his past it was connected to the gongmin city he was from originally the gongmin city from where his parents were forced to flee because of one prophecy which was made by a soothsayer that this peacock this evil peacock will die at the hands of a panda and so this man this peacock he decided to destroy every panda in the village his parents put him in a radish basket a radish crate and sent him away to china where he was raised by a goose and he eventually went on to be the dragon warrior so what you are comparing that story to mani's story no 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 i'm not comparing i'm not comparing i just said that when you have self confidence self determination mm. and will power anything is possible mm. like even when he was on a journey and struggling so hard he did not lose hope he did not lose his self confidence his determination his will power to reach that mountain top just like this dragon warrior did not lose his determination in order to stop that evil peacock mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it was a very good story on a self determination on a course mm. well mani you were assisted by your friends and also by the people who had put the metal spikes and the chains there in the past where they had um, made it possible for other people to 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 climb exactly did you say at the top there was a there was a small temple yes uh, eric there was a small temple and there is a accommodation also for 500 people that was built uh, in a uh, time span of 7 years with the help of devotees uh, selfless de devotees they were carrying uh, stones they were carrying cement packs they were carrying sand they were carrying iron rods and they did selflessly for the Ex, uh, uh, spiritual reasons and uh, they wanted to make people to stay there and enlighten maybe mm -hmm. to to uh, to stay there but uh, uh, it, it, it i try to imagine how difficult it was to bring all of those materials up yes, they built for 7 years mm -hmm. Okay, well I'm glad it was a good experience for you. When was did this happen last year? When did this happen? Last month. Last month? Yeah. Ah, so it's still very fresh in your mind. Yes. Yes. Mhm. Mm and it was interesting how your friends on the way they were reading ancient poetry and scriptures because, you know, this mountain and mountains in general does have re traditional religious significance. uh but um but you slept through that but still you took it very seriously it was very meaningful to to you yes i was worried about the uh, trekking the the uh, task so i was worried how am i going to do so mm -hmm. well you were marshaling your strength by taking rest you yeah. were getting ready for the for the struggle and the challenge yes yes okay anybody any other thoughts i already shared in the chat mani i really loved the way you told it so honestly we were really reliving that journey through and it makes a lot of sense now that you mention it it just happened last month so it's really mm. fresh and congratulations for completing that journey thank you thank you sada thank you aishi Okay uh uh S1 and you're back or have you been with us all along Uh your microphone you've got to turn your mic on I was I was I had my headphone on No that's Priya yeah no I'm saying uh, Miss uh, S1 Yeah, yeah. I, I was right through Very good very good Uh did, did, did S1 and did you ever climb mountains was that ever interesting to you the particular mountain which uh, mani was talking about i only took a bus up to the mountain foot hill and came back again by the same uh -huh. bus back okay i never actually visit went up uh -huh. okay 
All right. Anybody else? Any any thought, resonation, comment? You know, we all choose our own challenges, right? Our challenges come in many different forms. Okay, so shall we say good night for now? Wonderful. Okay, thank you very much, storytellers. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to all of you. Thank you. Yes. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye for now. Good night. Good evening.